everyone to please find their seats. Put their phones, PDAs on silent mode like I just did, which I normally forget. Um, and it is a, a genuine uh, pleasure and, and privilege to, to welcome you to George Washington University. Uh, since there's some new faces here, my name is Frank Salufo. Uh, I direct our Center for Cyber and Homeland Security. Um, and I display varying degrees of ignorance in lots of subjects. But uh, fortunately, we have someone uh, joining us today who is incredibly well informed uh, on the issues we're going to discuss. Obviously, transportation security is uh, front and center uh, of all of our minds, not just today, uh, but always. Um, and whereas the threat continues to morph and adapt and change, our terror the terrorists uh, continue to change their tactics, techniques, and procedures, uh, one thing that remains consistent is that transportation, aviation at the top, surface transportation, continue to be the terrorist target of choice. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's only appropriate um, that we uh, spend some time understanding uh, not only the, uh, the transportation security activities, but specifically the state of TSA and the important role the women and men of TSA play to keep uh, our country safe. Um, and, and it is uh, a genuine pleasure to, to have uh, the administrator with us today, uh, Admiral David Pekoski, who is the seventh confirmed uh, um, administrator of TSA. He came to the job as a vice commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, so he was already part of the broader uh, what is now Homeland Security family, and he brings the, uh, the vigor that uh, that Coast Guard had brought to, to, to the fight on these issues, specifically um, to, to support the TSA mission here. Um, and before uh, we get into the conversation, uh, and, and Admiral Pekoski is going to, to provide some opening remarks, I have the pleasure of uh, sitting down with him for a Q&A. We're going to tee up uh, a video that I think uh, captures some of the complexities, some of the challenges uh, that TSA faces uh, all the time, but particularly um, back in 2017. I mean, if you go back to its roots, Obviously, 9-11 is front and center, but we also uh, need to recognize that the threat is changing. And, and if we could just tee up the video and uh, go from there. The TSA is considering new scanners for carry-on bags. The machines produce 3D images similar to CAT scans. Computed tomography provides a 3D image as opposed to the 2D image they're used to seeing, and it provides a much more clear image for the officers to interpret what they're seeing and decide whether there's anything in there that needs to be further inspected. TSA has been working with airlines and manufacturers to bring CT to the checkpoint. The machines can detect explosives in laptops, liquids, and gels, which means the days of having to take things out of your carry-on bag could be numbered. TSA and Amtrak coming together to test some technology. The scanning system is designed to spot hidden explosives and suicide vests. And the equipment is now being tested in Los Angeles, but it has been tried at major rail hubs all over the country. Flying out of Indianapolis International Airport is about to get safer and quicker. It can speed up the process. Uh, we um, are have been test testing this equipment and um, it's been working within 12 seconds or less. The system checks the passenger credentials to electronic databases, including airline ticketing records and secure flight watch lists. The system excels at detecting fake identification. At the Punta Gorda Airport, the Roanoke Blanksburg Regional Airport, Capital Region International Airport, TSA is offering a pre check enrollment event beginning today at the airport in Sarasota. Southwest and JetBlue are announcing incentives for their frequent flyers to sign up for TSA PreCheck. TSA has added 11 airlines to the TSA PreCheck family, increasing the percentage of PreCheck carriers from 90% to 95% and counting. The next time you fly out of Buffalo, Niagara International, be prepared to do things a little differently when you're going through the security checkpoint. The goal is to remove objects that can obscure weapons. As a result, x-ray officers receive cleaner, less cluttered images, making it easier to spot items of concern in an effort to increase public safety. To protect against terrorism, the Department of Homeland Security's new screening guidelines will affect more than 300,000 passengers daily flying into the U.S. from overseas. It is time 
that we raise the global baseline of aviation security. We look at intelligence all the time to make sure that we're ahead of the threat uh, that's out there. And we saw some trends uh, developing in those countries, and we thought it was prudent to put some additional measures in place. The Transportation Security Administration and United Airlines unveiled the final phase of their automated screening lane. This new system made it a lot faster for us to get through the line, and it also made things a lot more fun. If you can save a few seconds on every passenger, well, that starts equating to minutes and hours. That's what the automation of a system like this can do. It improves safety and security, and it also improves customer service. Customer experience is going to improve, and the safety and efficiency and the effectiveness of the TSA is also going to improve. It's a win-win situation. TSA will test out new technology. The idea is that passengers will be able to verify their identity with just the wave of a hand, replacing boarding passes with fingerprints. It eliminates the, the errors that could occur and it streamlines the process, enhancing the throughput for our customers. And that's one more way the TSA can help the traveling public. TSA released a new mobile application that brings TSA employees news that is important to them right at their fingertips. This app is intended to improve communications across TSA and make it easy and convenient for TSA employees to access TSA news and information. The TSA News app allows headquarters and field leadership to connect directly to their employees unlike ever before. Hurricane Irma. Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Maria slamming into the island, and as you heard, one official saying the island is destroyed. This week has become the deadliest week for the California wildfires in the state's history. In 2017, FEMA deployed its surge capacity force in waves. Over 4,000 volunteers from 36 different government agencies responded to the call. The Transportation Security Administration had the second highest deployment with 889 volunteers nationwide. We're on the air to report a situation unfolding right now at the airport in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where there has been a shooting. I saw passengers running from around the corridor. That's when I knew it was time to go down and notify everyone else. One grateful passenger returned to the airport to personally thank TSO Nancy Medeiros for her help during the incident. Medeiros saw the passenger and her baby on the concourse and selflessly guided her and others to the tarmac. It was just a lot of mass chaos and panic. I met this one young lady with a learning disability and I spoke to the young lady's mother and I promised her that I uh, would take care of her daughter. His heroic actions were above and beyond the call of duty. More than a dozen TSA employees went above and beyond the call of duty, risking their lives to guide passengers to safety. A smoking backpack is quickly contained outside of Orlando International Airport thanks to the quick action of a Transportation Security Administration officer. On Friday, TSA says Ricardo Perez swooped in and ran the bag away from travelers. We don't know if there's a bad guy out here or not until they come through the screening process. So every day, everybody here in a blue shirt risks their lives. Please join me in welcoming TSA Administrator Admiral David Pikoski. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Frank, for uh, hosting us here today at the George Washington University. Uh, your incredible work here at the center makes a significant contribution to the security of our country. And Frank was one of the very first people that was involved with the uh, Office of Homeland Security uh, when it was established by President Bush right after 9-11. Uh, in fact, I think he's one of the very first presidential appointees. Uh, Frank has always been a great partner with DHS and TSA, and we really appreciate uh, his introduction today and his hosting us for this State of the TSA. To everyone here and those watching this live stream uh, via TSA's Facebook page and YouTube channel, Thank you for joining us, and good morning to our employees watching this on TSA TV. And I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge a large segment of our workforce that can't stop and watch this live because they are focused on screening passengers and luggage, inspecting cargo operations, testing new technologies, working with our international partners many time zones away, or providing security to aircraft in flight. We celebrate all of you and thank you for your service. I am honored to be part of, TSA, of, of the TSA team, and I'm excited to share this first ever State of TSA with all of you. Before I begin, I want to circle back to that video we just saw. In those few minutes, you can see that 2017 was an extremely busy year for TSA. We rolled out and tested innovative security technologies, 
continued to expand our pre-check partnerships, and took proactive measures to dramatically raise the baseline of global aviation security. We also responded to what Mother Nature had to offer with hurricanes and wildfires that devastated parts of our country from California to Puerto Rico to the U.S. Virgin Islands. In response to these events, not only did we send our thoughts and prayers, we also sent people and resources to help. As you saw from that video, hundreds and hundreds of TSA employees volunteered to deploy with the FEMA Surge Capacity Force to help the people that were directly impacted. Our volunteers were away from their families for weeks on end to help other families and communities get back on their feet. These were not glamorous assignments, but they were important to us and to those we served. The destruction in some of these communities was extensive, but despite their suffering, survivors were quick to extend a hand of welcome to our volunteers. Some went so far as to brew a cup of coffee in their homes, in homes that didn't have roofs at the time. At the same time, hundreds more, transportation security officers, canine teams, visible intermodal protection and response, or Viper teams, deployed to take care of our TSA family and help affected airports get back up and running quickly. In many cases, they helped to secure and repair damaged airport infrastructure uh, and slept on the floor of a terminal in order to be ready once the storm passed through. You see, airports are critical to both the response and recovery of a community following a disaster. We, TSA, Customs and Border Protection, the Federal Aviation Administration, airports, airlines, and local authorities work side by side to ensure flight operations could resume as soon as possible. We, collectively, we're very successful in doing this. Uh, it's a difficult task carried out in such a way that it demonstrated the resiliency of our transportation system. Our field leaders at all levels also displayed outstanding crisis leadership skills, maintaining security operations while ensuring the safety and well being of our men and women. And our headquarters team supported our affected employees, some of whom lost their homes. They collected gift cards and donations, set up emergency leave programs arranged temporary and permanent relocations, and implemented an, an innovative Adopt-A-Family program, all in a tremendous effort to help the thousands of TSA members impacted by the storms and fires. Since coming to TSA, I've been inspired by the dedication of TSA's workforce, dedication to both the mission and to each other. Let me give you an example. Supervisory Federal Air Marshal Don Anderson of the New York Field Office illustrated this dedication in a most compelling way when he spoke on behalf of TSA at the DHS 15th anniversary celebration this past Thursday. Reflecting on his time in TSA, he said, while I am proud of my accomplishments and I am proud of the achievements of my distinguished colleagues, I would in fact trade it all in for a seat on any one of the four flights on 9-11. That is dedication. The memory of 9-11 motivates all of us to do our critical work in support of our fellow citizens every day in airports and surface transportations ac across our great country and beyond. At the end of that video, you saw a few examples of employees going well above and beyond, stories that exemplify the character of the TSA workforce. I have invited some of the officers featured in that video to be with us today. And for Rick, Adam, and Nancy, I will share your story, and then at the end of the story, I'll ask each of you to stand so that we can all recognize what you did. Expert Transportation Security Officer Ricardo Perez of Orlando walked right up to that smoking bag last November, which for all he knew was a bomb. He picked it up and quickly identified where he could put it to minimize the effects of any possible explosion. He didn't run from the danger. He didn't think of himself. Instead, he quickly assessed the situation, trusted his instincts, and took swift action. Everything that he did that day was with the safety of others in mind. And he reminded us that our frontline officers risk their lives every day for the traveling public. Ladies and gentlemen, please recognize expert transportation security officer Rick Perez. <laughs> Supervisory Transportation Security Inspector Adam Felice, based in Anchorage, Alaska, was waiting to board a flight home with his wife at Fort Lauderdale Airport when the shooting started on that tragic day in early January, just over a year ago. Adam wasn't even on duty that day, but he reacted quickly and calmly to a terrifying situation and saved lives. He trusted his instincts and acted quickly. Around the same time, Transportation Security Officer Nancy Medeiros 
was in the middle of a routine bag search at the checkpoint when she heard what sounded like gunshots. After another officer radioed a code red, she escorted over 100 people, including families with small children, to safety. Ladies and gentlemen, please recognize expert transportation security officer uh, Adam Feliz and transportation security officer Nancy Medeiros. Each of these officers demonstrated through their own actions the courage and dedication of our entire workforce. For their actions, Officer Perez and Inspector Felice received the Geraldo Hernandez In the Line of Duty National Service Award at TSA's Honorary Award Ceremony this past December. Officer Hernandez was the first, and God willing, will be the only transportation security officer to be killed in the line of duty. He was tragically shot and killed at, the, at a checkpoint at LAX over four years ago by an active shooter. We continue to honor his service and sacrifice with this award. The three officers I just highlighted are an important part of a workforce that is over 60,000 people strong, a capable and diverse workforce with a complex, expansive, and absolutely critical mission. As many of you know, TSA was created in the wake of the 9-11 attacks and assigned the urgent mission of preventing another large-scale act of terrorism on the American transportation system. Just a few days ago at the DHS 15th anniversary celebration, we heard from a panel that included Secretary Kirsten Nielsen, uh, former Secretaries John Kelly, Michael Chertoff, and Tom Ridge. During that panel, which was moderated by Frank Salufo, Secretary Ridge reminded us of those frantic early days right after 9-11, and his experience as our first Secretary in literally the building the department from the ground up. He also eloquently identified one of the challenges we face as a security organization. That is, it is difficult to celebrate success when success means that something didn't happen. In the years since 9-11, we have been successful in our fundamental and vital mission, but we, we must remain ever vigilant. Aviation and surface transportation hubs remain highly priced targets for terrorists. Their modes and methods of attack have evolved and become much more decentralized and opportunistic than ever before. Therefore, we can no longer focus solely on the elaborate plots that the established terrorist groups have pursued since 9-11. Today, we are also confronted by a current of less sophisticated techniques and tactics where lone wolves, many radicalized on the internet, are using inexpensive and low-tech methods to target Americans. We can no longer focus only on preventing the bad guys from getting into the security of an airport. More and more, we must focus on both sides of the checkpoint and in the public areas where the airport and surface transportation systems intersect. We face ambitious adversaries who are continuously looking for a point of attack and waiting for their opportunity. Our job is to make sure they never have that opportunity. Since coming to TSA six months ago, I have made it a priority to meet with TSA employees, industry leaders, members of Congress, international colleagues, and other stakeholders. These discussions have only strengthened my conviction that securing our transportation systems requires a proactive and agile agency embodied by a professional workforce that coordinates closely with key partners in government and industry. For TSA to continue to succeed in our mission, we must not only focus on addressing the threat where it is today, but also on our capabilities for the future. In order to stay ahead of the threat, TSA must think faster and act faster. We must be faster to minimize vulnerabilities and make risk determinations. And we must be faster to acquire and develop and deploy new technology to the front lines. We must engage, inform, and empower the public to see themselves as part of the security solution and as recipients of a secure system. Security is a collective effort, and it takes all of us to secure the homeland. We have to think more strategically and make the most of our resources. That is what our new TSA strategy calls on us to do. Our strategy, which will guide TSA through our 25th anniversary in 2026, identifies three key priorities that are most critical for our continued success. The first is support to support and strengthen frontline operations, TSA's bread and butter, and improve performance in our core security operations. That, of course, includes getting our transportation security officers better tools, better procedures, and better training. Additionally, we must continue to support the owners and operators of surface transportation systems who do the important work of securing pipelines, buses, rail, freight, maritime, and mass transit systems. It also includes focusing on things people don't see, 
like vetting, analysis of intelligence information, raising global aviation security standards, inspections, air marshals, and partnerships with industry. We know our adversaries, those that want to do us all harm, are continuously evolving their tactics. We need to reflect on this. When our adversaries evolve, they concede that we have been successful today, and they demonstrate that they have not given up on attacking us tomorrow. Second, I mentioned before the importance of thinking and acting quickly. This is an area where TSA has struggled as we have grown further removed from our entrepreneurial startup days immediately following 9-11. In this strategy, we recommit ourselves to that entrepreneurial spirit. We are looking at everything we do with an eye towards innovation, asking ourselves how can we foster continuous improvement in our processes and technologies and make the most out of the resources that we have. Innovation is central to our continued success and our innovation task force spends every day trying to answer that question. The innovation task force is collaborating with industry, airlines, airports, and equipment manufacturers to find and deploy the very best technology for increasing security and improving the passenger experience. We are also looking closely at ways to improve processes and structure. We will be adjusting our organizational structure to make us more proactive and more agile. And third, we must recommit ourselves to our workforce. The greatest technology in the world won't help us if we don't have a trained and motivated workforce of security professionals leading at every level of our organization. We will invest so that, they that we can attract, hire, train, develop, and retain our workforce to make TSA an employer of choice. Everyone who is part of TSA will reflect our core values of integrity, respect, and commitment each and every day in their service to America. Securing our nation's transportation systems is a complex task, and government cannot do it alone. Transportation security is a collective effort, and all of us have a role to play. When we perform our roles well, we create a choreographed partnership defined by a shared commitment to safety and security. With this strategy, we focus on safeguarding all modes of transportation. This is accomplished through the dedicated men and women of TSA and through our partners, stakeholders, and the American public. Security is our common objective, and we can best achieve it through shared and complementary effort. That is the essence of the new strategy, one that will guide us to accomplish our mission of protecting America's transportation systems while ensuring the freedom of movement of people and commerce. Since our inception, TSA has lived by the motto, not on my watch. This has served as a powerful call to action for the TSA workforce. It is my hope to encourage an even stronger relationship between those outside of TSA and those within by acknowledging that everyone's role, everyone has a role in our shared security mission. Together, we will adopt and embrace a new creed, not on our watch. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I look forward to, to the discussion we'll have uh, with Frank in just a few minutes. And thank you all for all you do and all you will do to secure our transportation system. Thank you. Well, thank you, Admiral. Thank you for the uh, tour de force on the many mm -hmm. challenges and opportunities facing uh, TSA and, 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 uh, and the, the significant mission that the men and women who serve uh, at TSA uh, play. I, I want to start with some of your, one of your last points, not on our watch. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd be remiss uh, to not mention you have deep roots in academia as well, uh, having served on the uh, as a trustee at the uh, Coast Guard Academy, a, a, an amazing institution, and also taught across town at right. American University. So the, the, your, your willingness to engage with uh, partnerships beyond the government, I think, mm -hmm. is very important. But I want to start with a question along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the private sector plays a critical role, and industry plays a critical role in assuring right. uh, TSA's mission. Um, can you give a little insight as to how we translate the nouns into verbs from public-private partnerships? Uh, how are you actually making that work, and, uh, um, and, and what are you most excited about? Yeah, thanks, Frank. Uh, well, one of the things I've been most excited about is I've traveled around the country and met with our industry partners and our other government partners, our international partners, is how really, truly deep those partnerships are. 
And I'll give you a great example of that uh, with our airline and the airport partners. Um, we have a, a new screening system that we're putting in place around the country that embodies what we call automatic screening lanes, which essentially allow passengers when they're coming through the screening lane to, uh, for five people to divest their, their um, carry-on bags into bins at the same time. So rather than going one by one, five people can do it at the same time. We have about 128 of those systems now deployed throughout the country. Uh, TSA didn't buy a single one of, of those units. And essentially what we've been able to do with the generosity from our airline and airport partners is to use their ability uh, from the private sector uh, to put funds to something quickly, um, to design and, and build in these systems in existing checkpoints uh, and airports. And then we've been able to go through really developmental and operational tests and evaluation uh, in real time. I and mean, we're, we're looking at 128 systems. That's a very extensive way to test a, a system to see if it will work uh, for us in the future. And so what I, what I hope will happen as a result of this is that when we go through our own federal acquisition process, which is now in process, that we can skip some of those steps because we've really proven that this, this technology does work. We know what, what number of people it will require to, to successfully operate. We know what the maintenance costs will be. We know what the throughput numbers will be throughout the, throughout the airport. So that's, that, that's a really good example of how that public-private partnership actually comes to life. And, and that's something that I'm really interested in, in pursuing even further because, you know, like I said, you know, the, the, one of the core themes of our new strategy is to accelerate action. And, and I, you know, I think the TSA has been really very good at coming to good decisions. Sometimes it takes us longer than it should to get to those decisions. But then when we get to the point where we have a decision made and we want to implement it and actually deploy new technology uh, out across the 450 airports that we work at, that takes much longer than it needs to. And when you, when you match that up against a threat picture that's always changing, that's always looking for where our vulnerabilities might be, we need to be much faster at, at fielding technology and putting it in the hands of, of our officers like we, we, we celebrated you know, what they've been doing today. Uh, my goal and, and the goal of my leadership team is to bring more of those solutions to them faster um, so that they can, they can be even further ahead of the threat as it develops. Awesome. And I mean, just given your previous background as, a, as an officer in the U.S. Coast Guard, I mean, we talk about pushing capability mm -hmm. to the front lines, right. to the edge, and, and enabling and empowering the workforce mm -hmm. to, to work in conjunction with the private sector, uh, I think, is, is very important and right. should be part of the DNA of uh, yes. uh, TSA uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. When, when I think of TSA, I often think of layered defenses. Right. I, I mean, most people think that it's a static mm -hmm. set of issues, but the reality is it has to keep pace with this constantly changing right. threat. Uh, and the second reality is, is the sheer scale and scope. It's, it's huge, and I don't think people have an appreciation for just how big of a footprint uh, we're talking about here. But I'd be curious uh, um, on where you see some of that risk-based approach, the layered defenses, if you can maybe give us a, a little bit of a, a taste of what that looks like. And then in particular, where, where do you see passengers actually fitting into that experience? Sure. Sure. Well, you know, to give you a sense for the scale, um, TSA on a typical day, like let's take today, uh, we will screen 2 million passengers um, through our system just to here in the United States. That's to say nothing of, of all the work that we're doing internationally, inspecting uh, international operations with the airlines and airports uh, internationally to make sure they comply with the, with the rules that we have put in place. Um, but when you talk about layers, I mean, that, that's really critically important. And any, any security organization, any leader of a security organization will always say, I don't rely on completely on any single layer because I just need to be able to buy down my risk by having multiple ways that we interact uh, and, and try to prevent something from happening. And you know, when you look at TSA, most, most people will identify TSA, uh, as I did before I came into this job, by the officers who stand at the checkpoint who wear a blue uniform that says TSA on it. And each one of those two million passengers will see about five officers uh, on each leg of their journey as they go through. Um, but in addition to those, those officers at the checkpoint, who I think do a fabulous job, are a whole host of other TSA men and women that uh, do all the vetting, for example. As soon as a passenger buys a ticket, it, that passenger uh, goes into a vetting process so we can assess risk based on, on the passenger. Uh, we have a lot of people in, in airports doing inspections to make sure that, that airports and airlines comply with the regulations that are in place uh, for overall security. Uh, we have our canine teams, that, you know, the dogs and the handlers that, that have done a, a great job 
uh, of, of providing enhanced security at the checkpoint and around the entire airport into the public areas, as I mentioned uh, during my remarks. Uh, and then once you get on board a plane, you know, passengers may not see and they, and they really shouldn't be able to recognize our federal air marshals, but we have air marshals on flights uh, every day. Um, and, and the air marshal's job is to make sure that that flight uh, is secure uh, while, it's, while it's airborne. So there are multiple, m multiple layers of, of what TSA does. And then I would kind of overlay all of that with the fact that um, uh, we've been do doing an awful lot of work over the past year, uh, initiated by Secretary John Kelly when, when he was the Secretary of Homeland Security, to really raise the, uh, the bar on global aviation security. And what that has required is, is a whole network of, of TSA men and women internationally. Um, to work with our international partners uh, to ensure that some of the measures that, that we've put in place are in fact being accomplished. And also, again, to go back to that partnership is to work with our industry partners to say, okay, we have a measure in place, but might there be something else that we can do that will give us an equivalent or even greater level of security? And, and we've always been very open to those other uh, alternative procedures is what we, we term them, a, a different procedure that gets us to the same outcome than one that we described. And, and I, I imagine that also includes experience that our men and women overseas in a battlefield sort of an environment and fielding certain technologies that can be useful uh, there as well. Right. Well, you know, we're always looking for, for technology improvements. In fact, um, you know, one of the technology improvements that uh, we're testing, in fact, we're, we're testing it uh, up in New York uh, at Penn Station uh, over the last couple of weeks is a technology that kind of applies not in the aviation realm um, uh, solely, but also in the surface transportation realm, where it's basically a standoff detection technology that um, just receives uh, the energy that a human body transmits. And so as a person is walking towards these receivers, uh, that receiver will tell if a person might have uh, something that's blocking that energy from, from being read, i.e. perhaps an improvised explosive device or a weapon. And we've tested that out uh, very well. And that's, that's really a very promising technology that we would fully test and certify. And then the uh, owners and operators of surface transportation systems would have the opportunity to buy those uh, should they want to deploy them in their systems. Awesome. You, you opened two, two lines of question I might want to zero in on, and that is uh, surface transportation. So obviously aviation uh, is a lightning rod. And, and, and I think uh, Secretary Nielsen in the conversation we had last week referred to it as the Super Bowl, uh, as, a, as the, the crown jewels uh, of uh, the terrorists. But we do have a vast surface transportation uh, risk. And if you look at the threat overseas, notably in Europe and, uh, and, and elsewhere, rail is uh, at the top of that list as well. So I'd be curious what, what we're thinking there uh, in terms of some of the uh, um, capabilities and also the technology. So, because then you open up a line on innovation, which I'll get to in a sec. Okay. So. Uh, so we do an awful lot of work uh, in service transportation, but the major difference, of course, is that in aviation we actually provide the security. Uh, in surface transportation, we work cooperatively with the industry to develop guidelines, and then we work with them to uh, find ways that we can further improve the guidelines um, or you know, establish best practices that which we can share across the entire system, across the entire country. And I think in some ways that model uh, has gotten us further along than a regulatory model will, because when an inspector shows up in a regulatory model, uh, there's always the penalty uh, part of a regulation that's in the minds of a partner. Uh, with, with guidelines, there's not that in mind, and so there's there's much more openness we find in sharing. Hey, you know, this is what we see that works here in in this mass transit system. There might be some applicability uh, across the board, uh, and so surface transportation uh, is a key focus of mine. And if you look at my travel schedule and, and who I've met with since I've been the administrator. Uh, I've spent a good amount of time in surface transportation uh, venues with, with the leaders of those systems to really kind of try to understand uh, what their concerns are and how we can best help them. Uh, but one of the other ways that, that we help them a lot is by providing intelligence information to them, to, to, to show them what we see from an intelligence community perspective that might help them prepare for something that, uh, that could impact their system. Um, and, and we also, when we visit our surface transportation partners, we're really in the mode of, of, of asking them, hey, what kind of information do you need us to act as your advocate 
within the larger federal intelligence community that we can kind of head, bring, some, bring some light to some concerns that you might have. But I would just like to add something else that, that we're also working pretty hard on is that you know, we're very good as a, as a federal agency and have very strong ties with the intelligence community uh, that we can get the, uh, the really high quality intelligence information that the U.S. government has. But there's also an awful lot of information that our industry partners have um, that's not part of intelligence, if you, if you will, but it's part of information. And what we're working on very closely with them is to try to have more of a two-way dialogue in, in, you know, in their normal conduct of their business and their, their stream of commerce and what they're working with. Do they have information that might be useful to us to understand that might actually put some of the highly classified intelligence information in better context? Um, and so it's a very good two-way street, I think, that's developing. I, I'm glad you brought up intelligence, because mm -hmm. I, I genuinely feel it is the lifeblood for mm -hmm. our campaign against mm -hmm. bad actors and, and terrorism. And the objective is always to try to get there before the bomb right. goes off, obviously, left a boom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think TSA doesn't always get the, the, the just deserve in terms of how it is plugging into the broader uh, intelligence community. So uh, kudos. Uh, Kudos for that. But I also found your public-private partnership issue, because I think the private sector does mm -hmm. hold information. And that's very similar to what we're seeing in the cyber domain. Uh, right. Government lead by example, but ultimately the private sector is going to drive a lot of the solutions. So I'd be curious, without getting into any depth here, but uh, looking at NPPD and TSA, is, is cyber one of those issues that you're starting to think a little bit about? It, it sure is. We, th we think about it each and every day. We think about it with our own systems and we think about it with our, with our partner systems. And it applies uh, equally in the aviation sector and also the surface transportation sector. Especially in surface vehicles, trains, absolutely rail uh, control systems, yeah, yeah, uh, and things like that. And and you know, I, every single day, um, leaders in TSA uh, get intelligence briefs, and and every single day, uh, you know, we're asking questions that that will develop further analysis. And part of what we're 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 doing, and and the way we're approaching our industry partners, which I think has been very very successful, is as we get intelligence information and we have a security concern as a result of that. Rather than just decide what kind of mitigation measures we think we need to put in place, uh, we bring our industry partners in and we share with them the intelligence information that we have and basically say, hey, here is the, here's the security outcome we need to achieve. How would you, from the operation of your airline, your airport, your surface transportation system, how would you address, how would you mitigate uh, this particular threat. And I think we come to much better solutions as a result of that. I love the outcome-based approach yeah. Yeah, instead of measuring. Right. Measure what actually matters, right. that that is uh, something Washington as a whole doesn't right. always uh, uh, do as well as, uh, as it maybe should. Well, and the other thing, too, is it, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in flying an aircraft. I'm not an expert in, in uh, airport gate operations. Um, but, but we do have experts uh, on both those things, and, and it just brings a much more holistic view, and I think we get a much better result. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about innovation mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of both from a technological perspective, mm -hmm. I, I mean, obviously, and also from an entrepreneurial ethos right. perspective mm -hmm. and how you empower mm -hmm. the workforce and others, and then sort of this less agile acquisition process. How do you how do you sort of blend and square that circle? Right. right. Yeah, it's a great and question. And Congress and 100 uh, yeah. committees that have some bite at the apple on your budget. Well, I think everybody agrees that we need to do it all faster. Uh, and so the challenge is getting everybody to agree on how to do it faster. Um, because, you know, the, our acquisition process is adapted over time based on acquisitions that had some challenges. And so that, and whenever there's a, a challenging acquisition, the process gets modified so that that never happens again. And so you get layer upon layer of process added. Um, what we're doing is we're looking at some of the very innovative acquisition processes that certain elements of the Department of Defense use and see if we might be able to model some of those uh, in TSA. And the Department of Homeland Security is very, very focused on this because across the entire department, no matter which component you're talking to or even the department themselves, uh, there's, a, there's a strong desire to speed up our acquisition process, but also at the same time, get very good at clearly defining what it is we want, uh, buying the right things at the right, you know, on, on schedule, within cost, uh, and, and having the capabilities that, that we require. So this is a, a work in progress, but I do think that there's a real opportunity to pull some of the like we talked about earlier, some of the capabilities of the private sector. Because for us, you know, as you know, to put something into 
testing and evaluation, you need to have money appropriated to do that. Mm -hmm. In the private sector, you don't need to go through an appropriations process. You have the money. Um, and so you, you can put resources to something very quickly. And you know, I think one of the things that, that um, across government we need to get a little bit better at is, uh, in my private sector experience, uh, is, you know, gets reinforced uh, in this regard is, we have to be willing to come up to a point and say, okay, we've tried something and it doesn't work, and then stop. Um, and then go on to something else that, that will work. Oftentimes, uh, we, we get very afraid to reach a fail point, um, but the idea is to fail early uh, and then move on and, and, and try something else. And every entrepreneurial organization I know of does that. And so that's part of what I'm talking about with bringing TSA back to its entrepreneurial roots is try some things, don't be afraid to take some risk, be measured about it, be reasonable about it. If it doesn't work, stop and we'll go on to something else. No, that, 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 that's, I think, so important. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, both from an adversarial standpoint, we're not talking about risk elimination. Mm -hmm. We're talking about right. managing risk as effectively right. and as efficiently as we can through multiple layers. But mm -hmm. that also goes for the, 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 the blue side for mm -hmm. uh, getting systems in place. The problem is it's very hard mm -hmm. to take risks, and it takes leadership to stand up for the, for the men and women who, who do that. So that, that I think, is... Uh, an incredibly important point, and I know you have so many others who would support mm -hmm. that effort. Calculated. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not talking about right. boondoggles right. on taxpayer right. dollar, but we're right. talking about calculated risk. Well, and, and when you look at an airport, uh, and you look at a large airport, there are many, many screening lanes in a large airport. You, you can, in my view, in, in, a, in a smart way, experiment with some things in a lane. Because mm -hmm. it's not the whole airport, and and you can meter your your passenger flow to be able to do that. The other thing that that, that pertains to this, I think, is is critically important, and, and I I would submit that TSA certainly has some work to do in this regard. Um, you know, we have we have, as I said, tremendous men and women that are are on the front lines of our organization, and they're doing the mission every single day. And and you know, when you and I do something every single day, we always think of ways how can we do this better. Uh, and what we need to get better organizationally is how do we get the ideas from our officers who are performing the mission day in and day out to get up to a point where we can make a more enterprise level decision. Um, and a key part of that is to be able to, uh, one, get, get the information that our experts on the front lines have, uh, be able to evaluate it quickly and get an answer back to them. And I think it's okay if the answer going back is, Hey, we've looked at your idea, and we don't think it's it's right at this point in time for uh, TSA wide application. But the p the important part is you have to say because mm -hmm. because of this reason. Here's the reason why we don't think it's uh, it, it's applicable right now. But thanks for participating. As long as you keep that cycle relatively tight and give good answers back, you're going to get more suggestions coming up. Uh, if you don't do that, and and a suggestion kind of goes up into the into a dark cloud somewhere and never comes back out, you're not going to get many more good ideas coming your way. Uh, that's awesome. I, I mean, again, something you would see, not to, to turn to the military, but the hot wash process right. after a situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the very pointy end of the spear has as much say as the combatant commander does right. at that point to, to try to learn from it mm -hmm. and to protect them mm -hmm. from the risk uh, uh, that they speak bluntly. I think that's, right. uh, that's, that's crucially and critically important. Um, let's look overseas a little bit. Um, I, I mean, obviously, the U.S. Um, uh, challenge is, is, is incredibly big, large from a scale perspective, but you're also dependent upon working with others in an international environment mm -hmm. where um, your ability to influence is not always as strong as it would be in the United States. Let's T talk to us a little bit about understanding that broader uh, system. Right. What, if I can be unfair, the, who are the, 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 the shining stars and, and who should we be thinking about uh, in a not so uh, positive way? Well, I think we're, we're at things globally, uh, which we, we put a lot of effort towards because you know, we would really much rather raise uh, global standards overall, and, and there are some some bodies like the uh, like ICAO, uh, International Civil Aviation Organization, that have a plan to do that. Um, but the, the way we, we approach it, and I think it's been very successful to date, is anytime you're working with a partner, uh, what's important in, in that in that uh, interchange is a relationship. You have you have to develop a relationship, and you have to develop trust 
and you have to develop understanding of somebody else's perspective. And before the balloon goes up. Absolutely. Before a crisis. It's, it's, it's all um, you know, pre-need relationships that, that, that are in place. Um, and, and I personally spend a good amount of time uh, doing that is just to call up one of my international partners with nothing particular on the agenda, but just, hey, how's it going? Uh, what kinds of things can we, can we work on uh, together? And so, you know, our, our key partners are, of course, our 5 eye partners mm -hmm. um, from, from an intelligence perspective because we all can see the, the whole load of, inf of intelligence information that might be causing us some concern. Um, and, and what we endeavor to do is to uh, when we look at something, and again, and again, it's a bit of the same process we use with our industry partners is, uh, hey, here's what we're seeing. What are you seeing? And then how do you think uh, your government will int intend to react um, to what we're seeing? And we very much try to coordinate that and really kind of see it from uh, another perspective because I think, uh, you know, these, these threats are generally global threats. And, of course, American airlines fly all over the globe. So we, we have a concern with American carriers uh, all over the globe. And we have our cargo carriers, our pure cargo airlines that are, that are in, in lots of places around the globe uh, that don't go direct back to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, a key part of this is definitely the partnerships, uh, first and foremost with our Five Eye partners, but really trying to work within the framework of an international organization, um, but, but trying to put some more, anytime you have an international agreement, um, uh, each individual country is going to want to put more specific detail into what certain terms mean or what certain measures might include. Uh, and so that's part of the process is to put some, to kind of flesh out some of those international plans and then put, a, put an aggressive timeline that's achievable, that's not so aggressive that you're just going to plow through. And, and if there are laggards, mm -hmm. would you have some say in influencing uh, concern of inbound travel? We, we would. And in fact, um, uh, the uh, Aviation and Transportation Security Act, which formed TSA, uh, passed by the Congress in, in 2001, uh, almost right after the 9-11 attacks, gives the TSA administrator significant authority to be able to do that. And we have exercised it. And you will exercise it. Uh, we, we have okay. and we will. Um, and, and, and it's been very effective. I mean, we, we, we can require certain measures for any any flight that's uh, uh, coming towards the United States or, uh, or, or any issue pertaining to an American-owned uh, carrier. And I had to live through passenger name record, the PNR mm -hmm. debate. So that's more right. or less been addressed with the Europeans yep. at this stage, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think they recognize mm -hmm. the threat and vulnerability as acutely as, uh, as, as we do. Mm -hmm. So, no, great. And, and, and sort of on the technology side, uh, one more question in terms of the workforce itself and how do you empower the workforce to to keep up with uh, with with all the technological advancements. Are you investing in the training and education uh, that's needed? Uh, and and then sort of on the dark side, is there an insider threat issue you guys are also uh, um, thinking about? Sure. Sure. Well, the you know the, the th one of the one of the major themes of the strategy that that we're rolling out is a commitment to our people, and a commitment to our people to me means uh, significantly investing in our workforce so that they have the the tools, the procedures, the training to be able to do the job that we ask them to do, which is a very difficult job to do, uh, and you have to be on your toes a hundred percent of the time. Uh, and the threat is absolutely there, particularly on the, on the avi aviation side, as as you mentioned. Um, and so we're going to be investing more and more in our workforce. One of the things that, that we've uh, we put in place is still working its way through the uh, executive branch approval process, but for our transportation security officers who are the lion's share of the TSA workforce, uh, what is the career progression for those transportation security officers? So we can say to a new person coming on board, um, hey, here's your, here's your pay and, and here's the uh, entry level training we're going to provide. And then here's a progression for you as you advance from, a, from a, an officer to a lead officer to a supervisory officer to a manager. And basically lay out the organization's commitment to our employees that, that as you advance, this is the both resident and non-resident training that we're committed to provide you to develop. I think the other thing that's really important uh, with respect to the workforce, you know, I feel this way, uh, I, I know you do, in a, every job you're doing, I want to know why I'm, I'm doing something. If, if you ask me to do something, 
I, I want to know why. Give me, give me a reason why. It's not a challenge. It's just I can do my job a whole lot better if I understand what's, what's, what's driving what you're doing. But kind of underpinning all this is that um, uh, we, we are not a resource-rich organization. Um, you know, we have a, a top-line budget that, like every other federal agency, has, has constraints attached to it. Um, and while we're increasing the presence of, of officers at our checkpoints, I still think more needs to be done there because what ends up happening um, at our checkpoints is when we have surge periods, um, like you know around Thanksgiving or, or uh, around the December, January holidays, or coming up in the next week or so around spring break, our officers at those checkpoints are working required overtime, mm -hmm. and we are not able to do as much training as we would desire to do during a surge period. And if you think about it, when you have more people coming through your checkpoints, so we'll hit days where we'll have two and a half. 2.7 million people coming through the checkpoints during these surge periods, that's really when you want your workforce trained. Um, and so we need to put more resources on the front line to be able to provide that flexibility, to be able to pull some officers off and to do some training, do some training on the technology. Uh, that what, what would it take to allow that? Uh, well, in, some yeah. flexibility and greater discretion mm -hmm. from the administrator to... From yeah. a budget standpoint, uh, a couple things in, in in the president's fiscal nineteen budget, uh, we have an increase in in frontline officers, uh, and and that's going to be important. So uh, so as that budget goes through the approval process, there'll be an increase there. There's also an increase in the fiscal eighteen budget. As you know, that's still going through the continuing resolution process, so that's not yet in place. Um, and then additionally, I mentioned in in my talk that we're going to look at how we resource the organization, and uh, what I'm going to look at is. Where is my risk in the organization? And, and then where have we bought down some risk through other things we've done? Um, and then, in my view, we've got to take some resources from areas that we might have bought down some risk and put it to where we have current risk. So in a way, this is um, uh, you know, trying to get ahead of the two-year mm -hmm. appropriation cycle to move uh, uh, human resources, uh, full-time equivalents, into areas where we have the most risk. Finally, um, you know, the new technology is absolutely critical to all this, and the, and the um, uh, computer tomography technology, the new X-ray technology that we're looking to deploy at our checkpoints. You know, we've gotten tremendous support from both. We hosted Catco recently, yes, and he yeah. made a big push for he that did. At, did. right on this stage. He did. Chairman McCall has made. Uh, and made, McCall, made, I've absolutely, been Chairman, and has has the administration. Uh, you know, we have in our budget um, over seventy million dollars for this project in fiscal nineteen. Um, that's, that's a new ad. It's a completely new ad. We don't even have a formal project stood up. So, you know, typically by the budgeting rules, until you have a formal project stood up, you don't get resources for it. But the administration saw the priority, saw the need, uh, and put a significant amount of resources in our budget to develop that technology. But what that does, from my perspective, in addition to allowing us to do a much better job at detecting things at the checkpoint, uh, in terms of how many we can detect and, and, and at what weight levels we can detect. It also gives the officers a much better tool because if, you, if you're looking at a screen and it's two-dimensional, and you can imagine, I, you know, I, uh, before I came into this job and I was a passenger, you know, I always watched that x-ray operator who I, I never could see the screen completely, but I always watched that x-ray operator and I knew what I put in my carry-on bags. And I'm thinking, how can they figure out what I have in there uh, based on the density of what's there? Um, this uh, CT technology goes from a two-dimensional view to a three-dimensional view. So the officers can Pretty move awesome. it around, they can slice it, you're going to get a much better view. And that technology is here. It's, it's here. It's being deployed in, in a limited... Uh, right, we're still doing some testing. Uh, we do use it now in, in check bags. So all your check bags, uh, when you check a bag at an airport, yep. it goes yep. into, into that system, and that's, that's also CT technology. But only recently have we gotten to the point where those machines are of a size and weight that we can actually put them in a checkpoint. So I'm really excited about that at that program, and I think it's going to make a huge difference uh, at our checkpoints, and certainly for our officers doing a pretty difficult job, you know, trying to make Absolutely. make sense out of that image. Absolutely, and I think uh, there's a lot of congressional support for that as well. Um, and we're getting close to that witching hour, uh, and the tyranny of time requires I be a bit of a tyrant. But I've got one more question, sort of looking okay. looking at that threat environment mm -hmm. again. And I mean, if you uh, look back over time, in the 80s, hostage taking was the mm -hmm. terrorist tactic of choice. Obviously, 9-11 turned the, mm -hmm. the, the plane itself uh, in right. that horrific attack into mm -hmm. a weapon. So it's sort of always been a, we tend to look 
ahead through rear view mirrors. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards you saw obviously uh, um, Al-Qaeda's affiliates, Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. in the Arabian Peninsula in particular, um, having some of the most innovative uh, IED um, uh, capabilities to try to evade security. Um, when we think of the homegrown jihadist threat, or a homegrown threat, period, I, I mean, and we're not just thinking of aviation. What, what is it that TSA is doing that perhaps isn't as well known as it should be in terms of trucks or vehicles being used as, uh, as weapons as we've seen uh, extensively overseas? Are there any initiatives there that uh, um, TSA is engaged in that perhaps uh, uh, the, the American citizens uh, you serve deserve sure. to, sh should know about? Sure, well, you know, that's, that's a major concern of, of anybody in, in, in security right now is, Absolutely. is that homegrown, self-radicalized individual gets radicalized on the internet. Um, if you look at some of the attacks that have occurred just in New York, uh, uh, Halloween and December 11th, those individuals weren't people that were on anybody's scope at that point in time. Um, and so we, we, are, we have done some things to get much better at being able to try, to, you, know, you, you just don't, you don't have advanced information, so how can you develop a security system or further enhance a security system to deal with this threat that might present itself that you're not, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you don't anticipate that day? Um, and a couple of things that, that we've been doing, we, we, we host uh, public area security summits. Uh, so we bring all of the owners and operators of, um, of, of, of transportation systems. So in the airport environment, it would be uh, the airport police department, the airport authority, if there's an authority, uh, the local police department, TSA, CBP, the FAA, uh, airlines. Um, uh, and, and we bring them together and we talk about, hey, if something happened in a public area of an airport, how would we collectively respond to it? And then you can just and there take, have been real incidents there have at been real the airport, incidents. not just the AV. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Scotland, LA, many. Right, right. And so you just take that, and, and, and that process actually you can map over into a surface transportation system because those are all, by definition, pretty much public areas. In fact, we just had a public area security summit here in Washington uh, in early February for surface transportation to kind of walk through some of the steps of, of what we would uh, put together. But one of, one of the common themes that goes across all this, it, it, it gets to a, a really operational issue, is having already in place operation centers in, in these major transit areas. Uh, if you look at an airport, having an operation center that's live all the time in an airport is really important because what happens if something occurs in, in, in the public area, or one of these um, uh, self-radicalized individuals starts to, to act out a threat, um, you want to have a system that's already warm that you can respond to quickly and importantly get accurate information out to your first responders and out to the public so that the public understands what's going on as, as it's developing. Um, and that's a key part not only in the airport environment but also in, in major transit hubs like you know, look at Penn Station, Grand Central Station uh, for example is, is just having that live so that um, and what that does as well which I think is really beneficial is if, you're, if all of the uh, participating agencies and, and and, and operators of, of transit systems are all together on a regular basis, it kind of goes to that relationship piece that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. You already see each other, and, and the relationship part is important not just at the leader level. Um, it's actually, in some ways, even more important at the, at the um, uh, local leader level, at, at the local worker-to-worker -worker level, that, that, hey, we know each other, we know we can trust each other, we know what each other's capabilities are, and we can share things uh, more freely with each other. So these operation centers tend to drive uh, more integration across the board at all levels. And I couldn't think of a better way to, because I mean, trust is everything, right? right? right. Trust among the partners, mm -hmm. tr trust between the consumer, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think you said something that I'm not sure everyone uh, heard, or at least it was, you were referring to the general public as a first responder yes. preventer right. in itself. So, right. and, and I think that is so important. When mm -hmm. I go back to Abdul Mutal, mm -hmm. yes, citizens are playing the role of right. FAMS as well as obviously right. not as, as well trained. I right. think that is so important. Um, and I think it's important to recognize the roots mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of, of TSA's creation, that is aviation, but I think it's also uh, the fact that our first responder communities have to be part of, of this solution beyond just the federal agencies. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you've got arguably the toughest job in Washington 
but I think also one of the most important jobs in Washington. And we tend to only talk about it when something goes bad. Um, I, I think that it's important to appreciate and understand that your team is doing good things all the time, and I think that needs to be part of this discussion. And Admiral, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your service, and, and I look forward to working with you Great. in the day. Hey, thank ahead. you very thank much, you. Frank. Appreciate it. Thanks. 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 Thanks.